Hello everyone, it's Elder Elizabeth Michelle Hinton with the Keeping It Real uh, with Elder Michelle Hinton. Amen. I thought that we'll just go with it that way. We have Keeping It Real talk on Thursday, but on Mondays, let's just keep it real. Let's get in to scripture. So we're going to give people time. I know that uh, a lot of people had holiday off, did some holiday traveling. I hope that everyone stayed safe. They masked when they were around people they did not know. So we know the Delta variant doesn't care that you've gotten your um, vaccines. We understand that there are those that are still able to catch the variant. So make sure that you're being safe and you're having safe practices when you're out traveling um, through the holidays. And then we're going to give people a little time to come on. Amen. Amen. I pray that you have had a wonderful and blessed week so far that your Sunday was amazing. Mine was. I had an enjoyable time. I actually got to um, go and fellowship with my home church. And um, it was men's day. And Elder McLam did a wonderful job of Bentonville from Bentonville um, area. He uh Put a mighty word out. Got to see my pastor, my first lady. Enjoyed. Got a few moments with them of laughter and love. And just enjoyed myself. And then went with, got together with family. And uh, we came together for family prayer. We had not done that for over a year because of the pandemic. We did, uh, before the pandemic, we met monthly and had family prayer and we had not done that um we had done one zoom prayer well conference prayer and had not been able to get together and oh the lord is just a blessing to our family and we got to get together yesterday so i pray that everyone has had a great holiday we've rested relaxed and now we're ready to get back into the job and take control and make sure that we come back with Jesus first and foremost. Let him hit the house, the church, uh, I'm, excuse me, not the church, well, church too, but let him hit that job before you even get there so that all is well. Amen. So I see that we have one on. We're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you all coming on. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get started uh, with the the message tonight, or the teaching tonight. Amen. Hey, it's good to see you, Mother Davis. Amen. Good to see you. Hallelujah. I pray that you are doing well. Amen. Love you. Love you. This is this is my prayer warrior partner, y'all. If y'all don't know it, it's my praise partner and my prayer warrior. Mother Davis and I... Oh, during the days that we were able to be in church, she was one I'd look across the room and we'd do a spiritual high five because that's my praise partner. Amen. Miss seeing you. Can't wait until we able to fellowship in person again. Amen. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to come out of Romans 6 and we're going to go to the 20th through the 23rd verses. And... um I don't know where God's taking it. <laughs> Amen. Because usually when I use this one, I just be like, that's where you use the sermon. Uh, you know, I'd rather have the gift than earn the wages. But he's talking something different. So we're going to see where God takes this. Amen. I'm just going to be the obedient vessel and let him use me as he will. It says, for when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you, ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, like I said, I don't know where he was going. I just am obedient to things. And I didn't have a topic. But in the midst of 
reading it. In the midst of reading it, he gave me the topic. What will your end be? If I was to use a topic, we would say, what will your end be? We are in Romans 6 and starting at the 20th verse. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Let, let's talk about those. When we were out in the world and doing our thing, there was a song that said from Denise Williams, it said, do what feels good to you. And I'm here to tell you that when we was in the world, I don't know about you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. And the truth is, I did everything that I felt like it was good for me to do. If it seemed good, if I liked it, it looked good, I thought it was good, I wanted to try it because everybody seemed to be happy in it, then I did. Why? Because, well, I wanted to do what made me feel good. Um, I wanted to party. See, because I was the little good girl. I didn't I didn't do too many things growing up. I um I pretty much went to school, came home. Went went to school, came home, went to church on Sundays, went to Sunday school, um, sang in the choir, did what I was supposed to do. Didn't do a lot of not doing what my mama told me. And so when I got grown. Yes, Lord. When I hit them, see, because even when I was in my teens, uh, 15, 16, I, now 17, I got disobedient and I got caught. But, uh, <laughs> but um, 14, 15, that 13, 14, 15, 16, yeah, I did things, but I mean, good Lord, my things was like years apart from each other. Yeah, I, I basically, this is what I did. I did what I was told. So, when I hit 18, I had a child. I got my own place. Told you at 17, I got caught uh, being disobedient to my mom. Okay? <laughs> not listening and following her rules. Going to break bad for a change and not be uh, the goody goody because everybody said it. And not only that, he looked good to me. So I did what I wanted to do, got caught. So at 18, had a baby, had my own place and everything, and I parted hard. Now, mind you, I watched out from my child because I was raised with that. But I parted. Man, I parted, I parted. I went to school. I got up. I would go party, get up early morning, pack up my son's stuff, take him to my aunt's because I didn't have a car, so I, had, I lived blocks from her. So I would pack up my baby, get all of his stuff for the day, his food, his pampers, pack it all up, push his stroller on those few blocks, carry him to my aunt's, take a little nap, catch the bus, go to school. Come home from school, get off the bus, get my child, roll on to my house, fix my meals and do my homework, whatever. But the problem was, I kept right on doing what made me feel good and what looked good. Because, see, this is what we like to do. We like to do what feels good. So, 20 is talking about it. It says, for when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. I had no righteousness. Talk about Jesus. What? I grew up in the church. Yeah, I could talk word because I knew Bible. Hey, I grew up in Sunday school. You know? I did Sunday school, Bible studies. I, I was, like I said, I sang in the choir, so I was out at the church. Oh, the, my pastor at the time, he was teaching and preaching the word. Yeah, I knew it, and I won't stand there. So I was not a servant to righteousness. I was free from it because I was servant of sin. And the fruit, it says, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Yes. I don't like for you to bring up a lot of my mess from back in the day. Yes, I have folks, and you know we all got them. Lord knows, don't be out here at some church 
and you trying to do right, here comes that one that knew you win. And here they come sliding up. Lord, I can't believe it's you. And as I have told y'all before, my favorite thing to tell them is, honey, that was then. This is now. Do you know me now? Don't try to hold me in the world from back there. But when these are the things that it says we are ashamed of, those fruits that in those days you are ashamed of them now, for the end of those things is death. And aren't you glad? We're going to get to that part. But aren't you glad that you can say, I'm not going to die because I'm not living that anymore? But what's your end going to be is the question. Because, see, that's where we're at. We're we talking about the end. Amen? Yes, sir, Mother Davis. That was then. This is now. You know, sometimes people try to hold us to those things. And I don't understand that. Because I'm like, you don't want to be held to your past mistakes. So why are you trying to keep me held to mine? That was my past, honey. And as I have on my page, it says, if you keep paying attention to my past, you're going to miss your future. Because you won't see Jesus opening doors for you because you too busily looking at the doors that he closed for me. So get out of that. We need to get away from that. It says, what fruit had you then, ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, oh, but now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness. And the end, everlasting life. See, I like that. Let me let me show you these parallels one more time. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Now we're gonna take the what the end is and let me drop to. But now being made from sin and become servants to God. See, here's the fruits. I like this this uh parallel on the fruits. I like this comparison. See, the fruit you had when you was in the world was unto unrighteousness. The fruit that you produced then was leading you into death. The fruit that you gave then, it was iniquity to iniquity, huh? So you even yielded your members unto uh, 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 sinfulness. Now, you say, what are you talking about? Let me carry you up a little bit. It says, I speak, uh, it says, being the being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. See, what Paul was saying in this, in that scripture right there, is that he had to talk to you plainly because he understands that we're talking about not yielding our members unto the lust of the flesh. He understands you have that as a fight. Why does he understand? Because he said, I asked the Lord to remove this thorn and the Lord told me my grace is sufficient. I will not remove the thorn. This is talking about the lust of the flesh. It's talking about those things that we want. So Paul was breaking it down for them. He was breaking it down to give them the understanding that I understand. I understand that you uh, have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. I understand that you used to do these things. I understand that your body, your flesh remembers what it liked and what it felt good doing. You know how it is when we come in and we we now, I, I teach this in the single and saved class about celibacy. And that you trying to do the right thing. So you're like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to um, stay celibate until marriage. And then you find yourself in a fight. Because you done met somebody. You really like them. They really like you. Y'all both from the church. But you're finding that you know what it feels like. Because you're not either one of your virgins. So you know what it feels like. And so Paul is saying, I understand that you're going to have this fight. But let me let me remind you of something. Let me teach you something in the manner of men. Let me teach you about the infirmities of the flesh. Let me tell you what happens. This is what happens. 
if your fruit is those things that you used to be ashamed of, the end to those things is death. But if your fruit, now that you are made free from sin, if your fruit is unto holiness, then your end is everlasting life. So what he did is he said balance and scales. Here's the thing. What do you want? You want to live or you want to die? You want to live or you want to die? This is how you learn what to do about what you got to deal with. When you are, I tell people all the time, I say, look, I am. I tell, this is, I'm teaching a little bit of my single and save class. It applies to us always, regardless of whether you're single and saved. It applies. Why does it apply to a married person? Because married people get tried as well. Um, some, some people just like married people. They don't want a single person. They want a person that's already married. That way they don't have to do any commitments. They can come in, swoop in, and sweet talk you. And next thing you know, you're in trouble. And so is your marriage. So this goes for both. I used to tell people, I tell them all the time, every now and then you got to take yourself a mental cold shower. What's a mental cold shower? I ain't feeling like dying today. Jesus is looking. Those things will stop you in your tracks and make all of that fun times in your body go away. You can have it. Just, just keep it in the back, in the roller decks. If you keep that thought in the roller decks and stuff start coming, let me tell you what your brain does. When your brain is in a fight or flight situation, it will roll back through its memory bank to find something to help. So when you in that lustful situation, it'll roll back to that roller decks to the part. Jesus is watching me. And let me tell you something. The first thing you think is, I do not want to take my clothes off in front of Jesus. You need to go home or I need to get my bags and roll up out of here. One or the other. So we got to start learning that just because it feel good doesn't mean it's good for you. And you don't get to do what you feel. See, that was Denise Williams' song, do what you feel. If it feels good, then do it. No, you don't. You, you know, everything that we like does not necessarily mean it's good for the body and the soul. See, um, sometimes I love bananas. I love their taste. They good. And you would say, well, bananas are good. They are unless you're diabetic. Then if you're diabetic, it's not good for the body because that potassium will take you down. It will put you in the hospital. So I love it. It ain't good for me. Oh, I love orange juice. Orange juice is good for you unless you're diabetic. The only time you're supposed to mess with that is when you're having a low. And then you need to bring it up. Then it's good for you. But see, everything that we like, everything that we see, if you don't believe me, go back to Genesis. She said It says that she looked on the fruit. Said that it looked good. The devil told her, nope. I'm trying to tell you. This ain't going to kill you. That ain't so. It's going to just open your eyes and you're going to be like God. You Well, he didn't say like God. He said you'll be as God's little G S on the end. Because he knew what he was saying. He was saying to her, go ahead. Go on and try it. It looks good. And if it looks good, then it's probably going to be real good to you. And so in Genesis, we find out the first time that Getting something just because it looked good to you don't mean it's good for you. It cost uh, the human race. Uh, it took Jesus to give us back eternal life because it, the first go round took it from us. So we got to learn to watch. Now, I'm not going to that last scripture yet. We're going we gonna to stay focused in the sin and what it brings and righteousness and what it brings. See, when we are children and calling ourselves children of the Lord, and yes, I got a lot more to go with these scriptures. 
Amen. We're going to go back up. I want to go back up. It's good to see you, uh, Brother Marquez. It's good to see you, Brother Wright. I just wanted to let you know I did see you and acknowledge you. Um, it says, when we go back up, it says, <laughs> uh, okay, so we having little issues, but that's okay. We, we still on. We're going to keep going. If you read Romans 6 and 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Okay, here's my thing. Jesus died, and when he rose, he had victory over death. Um, and now he is life everlasting. If you are in Christ, then you are free because you are dead to sin. Because when you did your baptism, you went down, you died, you rose. In Christ and if this is the case then why then do we act as if we cannot control ourselves not only that Paul taught us that yes you can because the grace of God is sufficient to keep you that yes you can and I ain't talking about just sex people okay there are some other things that we need to understand lascivious behavior mm-hmm Pridefulness, boastfulness, gossiping, backstabbing, backbiting, tearing each other down, not, uh, being a lover of ourselves, men pleasers. See, these are those things that we don't, they should not have dominion over us anymore. Because it says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. It says that Jesus came and died. It says, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. So, okay, that, let me tell you what it does. It took all our excuses away from us. You know that excuse. I couldn't stop myself. I couldn't help myself. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Because it says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. See, you have a choice and an, that is right there before you. At that moment, you can choose life or you can choose death. You can choose to do something that you're going to be ashamed of, or you can choose to do something that will make God proud. These are, the, are, are your choices. And he's telling us, yes, Paul said, yes, you can, because you have the power. We got to learn how to use it. We don't know yet. The preacher told us Sunday what our superpower was, and we still don't know how to use it. We do not, and let me tell you why we don't know how to use it. We don't know how to use it because we don't know how to enforce our faith. Let me say that again. We don't know how to enforce our faith. See, when... Uh, 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 a police officer is given a warrant for the arrest of a person. He goes and enforces it. If you break a law, he enforces the law. We don't know how to enforce our superpower. See, our superpower is not just to speak, having the power of death and life in the tongue, that's not only your superpower. See, to, the way to activate the superpower is with the key. Faith unlocks the door, okay? The key is your faith. You got to enforce your faith to put into action your superpower to speak life and death. What you going to do? What your end going to be? Are you going to choose that your end be righteousness or your are you going to choose death? That's the choices. See, we keep right on thinking there's a middle spot. There is no middle spot. You got one or two choices, life, death. Which one you choose? Whose team you on? Winner, loser. Whose team you on? There ain't but two teams. 
Jesus, devil, which team you on? What's your choice? We got to start understanding that. And the only way that you can use your superpower is you got to enforce your faith. That means put it into action. Don't keep talking that I got faith, but I can't walk that I got faith. Talk is cheap, honey. Actions speak louder than words. When the Lord says prove it, he don't mean say holler, hoop, scream, and shout, lose your voice. That ain't what, that ain't prove nothing to him except for you know how to scream. It's your day-to-day -day living that proves your faith. Do you get up in the morning with a praise on your lips? Do you follow his commandments to the best of your ability? Is his doctrine the doctrine that you keep? It says, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Hmm? So what are you doing? Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. This is Paul speaking. He's trying to tell it to you. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. But now you and you did those things that you didn't want nobody to know about. But here's the thing. I want the world to know what I'm doing now. Uh -huh. I don't care. If you tell me how I acted on Sunday. It's all right. Tell them that I was praising, because that's what you can say. You can't say nothing that I'm going to be ashamed of. Yeah. You uh, you say, oh, she was shouting. She got up and did some holy dance. She was praying. She was crying. It's okay, because I was praising. Those are the things that I'm not ashamed of, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I don't care where I am. I will proclaim him from the rooftop, from my window, from church, from the work, in my car, on the road. I don't care. And those are the things that I'm not ashamed of. Now, there are some things I did that I don't want you to talk about no more. Okay, so we got to learn. Amen. We have to learn. That now being made free from sin and become servants to God, we got a different kind of fruit. It's a fruit unto holiness. And it, it its end is everlasting life. So there again comes the, the question. You choose life or you choose death. You choose winner or you choose the loser. You choose Jesus or you choose the devil. What's your choice? This is where we're at. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read 23. And we're going to talk about that. 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, look at there. That same one that you, good evening, it's good to see you, uh, Roderick. That same one, we in Romans 6, 20 through 23. That same Jesus, that same one that many of us don't want to trust, that same Jesus that some don't want to follow his commandments, that same Jesus that you like, did he really die on the cross uh, or is it just a hoax? There are some people, trust me, that that's what they believe, and they still trying to prove that. They ain't found his body yet. Uh, neither have they found his clothes. Yeah. See, here's the thing. If they stole the body, the clothes would have showed up somewhere. They still ain't showed up yet. Because, see, they would have found them in some cave. They'd have found them buried somewhere. You still ain't found the clothes yet because it ain't so. He rose with it and took everything that he had with him. He took it back to heaven and sitting on the right hand of God, looking like you and me, making intercession for us because the wages of sin is death, but the gift, oh, the gift is eternal life. 
God has given us the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is, if, this is if we enforce our faith. When we enforce our faith, don't do what feels good and do it because it feels good to us, but instead deny ourselves, submit ourselves unto the Lord, resist the devil, make him flee, and then open the door when he knocks and let him in. Turn loose of your past. Your past cannot define your future. Your presence does. See, the present time can define your future according to what you do. Whatever decisions you make today, you live with them tomorrow. That's if God blesses you to see the next day. Now, here's the good part. The past has been thrown in the sea of forgetfulness. Your present mistakes that you make when you're blessed with the next day. Because his mercies are new every morning and his compassions fail not. Then the mistakes you made today don't carry over to tomorrow. But here's why what you do today defines your future. Because if you realize you made a mistake and you fix it. It defines your future because it gives you a better place in Christ. If what you do today in your present, you don't fix it when you realize you are wrong, then it defines your future because you are steadily out of the covenant with God. So we don't need to let the past hold us in our present. And we don't need to let the present Keep us from the passions at the, the new mercies of tomorrow. See, let go of your past. Do good in your present. And if you didn't make it good today, then if the grace and mercies that are new every morning are bestowed upon you, get it right. See, we might do what feels good for the moment, but if you recognize that you made that mistake, don't wallow in it. You got to learn to enforce your faith. I was talking to my family yesterday and there was the question of, does it mean you don't have faith if you uh, pray, but you cry and, and everything and, and you uh, ask God again? And I told him, I said, wait a minute, let me tell you the difference in faith. With faith, you might cry. You might cry because your heart get a little heavy. I said, and if you don't believe me, then let us go over to the scriptures in Matthew when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, I said, and if you go there, let me see if I can get that scripture right quick because I like to uh, put it out there correctly. And then I don't believe in telling people what I think. Instead, tell them what I know. Okay. Because what I think can kill you, what I know will save you. And then, so um, we know that when he goes in uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane. All right, let, let me get to it. Amen. I'm just working on it, people. Don't, don't trust me. Uh, okay, his agony in the garden. So what I was telling her is how... When he came to the garden of Gethsemane, he told him, sit here uh, while I go and pray yonder. And it's like this. I want you to see this, this thing that we must learn in how to enforce our faith. And that a heart that's heavy doesn't mean that you don't have faith. Listen to what he says. He says, my soul is exceedingly sorrow, sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He came and we know he comes to them and uh, what he they sleep. He said, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray. He tells them a warning uh, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Oh, he goes away again. He says, oh, my father. If this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Did you see the change in what Jesus said? 
When he said he was sorrowful even unto death, he first said it was a question. If it be possible, can you let this cup pass? So what it means is that sometimes we get into these things that are heavy for us. And yes, you might be feeling sorrowful. Here's the thing. Don't wallow. Get like Jesus. First, the Lord said, if it be that will, let it pass. Now, quickly, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but that will be done. But when he came back, he enforced his faith. Because he knew who his father was. And when he enforced it, he didn't say, if it be possible, let it. He didn't ask, could he bypass? He said, oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except. I drink it. Thy will be done. This is the thing that we got to start learning. Enforce your faith. Because the wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Savior. What is it saying, our Lord? What is it saying? It's saying you can work your way to hell. Let me let y'all catch that. You can work your way to hell. <laughs> but you can accept the gift. Now, what is the gift? That's what you ask yourself. What is the gift? It's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So who's the gift? You can either work your way to hell or you can accept the gift of Jesus Christ. You can accept that he came, he died for you, and he rose for the justification of your sin. You can accept that the chastisement of your peace was upon him. I have explained it before, but I will explain it for anyone that may be up here that doesn't know. That scripture, chastisement of my peace, was upon him. Let me explain what that means. You hear, heard me just read about the cup. The cup is the wrath of God's indignation. That means the wrath for the sin that Adam and Eve did. And it had to have a payment. And it was the wrath of God. Jesus went to the cross to take that chastisement. You say, well, what was the chastisement? Remember when he, was, he cried out, hello, I. Eloi, set back to me. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was the chastisement. You and I couldn't handle God turning away. Only Jesus could. And even he had to cry out. Now that's how bad it is to not have God looking out for you. That's how bad it is to have God have to turn his back to you. See, you all say, we say sometimes, I'm not going to say you all because we've all been there, done that. God doesn't care. Honey, if he didn't care, you couldn't take it. As they said in a few good men, you couldn't handle it. Not if he turned his back. Because even Jesus, who is divine, had to holler out. That's how bad it is to not have God. And you and I ain't divine. So we couldn't have possibly handled it. So here's the question. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you choose death or do you choose life? Do you choose the devil or do you choose Jesus? Do you work for your wages? And that's death. Or do you wait for the gift and accept it and live for the gift? Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. He is life. He is Yahim Elohim, the everlasting God. That means life everlasting. How many of you have really sat down and looked at your salvation and said, 
I don't deserve this. And why am I being such a fool to do some of the stupid stuff that I named earlier? Those things that are the lust of the flesh. And it ain't just sex. As I said before, they are disobedience. Being men pleasers. Being boastful. Being prideful. Lovers of yourselves. Lascivious behavior. Turning against God. Blasphemers. Liars. Cheaters. Stealers. Killers. And sometimes we kill us with this. When are we going to say enough is enough? I got to get really real with God. I need to do that which is pleasing in his sight. I need to submit myself unto him and present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is my reasonable service. When are we going to get it really in our minds that this is not something that is never going to come to fruition? See, a lot of us think that the world is never going to end. I'm just going to die. And then I'll go to heaven. Honey, I got news for you. All of us that will not taste death. He said so. And some of us are going to stand before the judgment and never die. Because he's going to come back. And he's going to call his church out. And those are us that make it. That is because we chose the gift of life. That is because you chose to serve righteousness unto holiness. You submitted yourself and yielded your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. Because, see, when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. But when you became free, you became servants to God, and ye have your fruit unto holiness... And the end is everlasting life. What's your end going to be? Ask yourself that question. Look at your life. Look at those things that you do. I'm trying to tell you. Stop with the looking at the surface. And you'll only scratch the surface. We better start going deep into that word, our, our uh, world. Our personal world. And don't worry about mine. You worry about yours. I'll worry about mine. But start going in deep. And go down under the surface. Get in the mirror. Where it ain't nobody but you and you. And every time you say something, you say something. Get with yourself. And then start getting real. And then once you're real with yourself, get real with God. See, because here's the thing. He already knows you. He knows all about you. And the things that you think are secret, they're not secret. Because he already knows. But it's time for you to get with yourself and admit some truths. See, I had to admit that I had a bad temper. I didn't, I didn't want to. And yeah, I knew I had one. But I didn't want to admit I had one. And I had to admit it. And once I admit it, that you know what, Michelle, you got a bad temper. It's nasty. And you need to work on that. Because you can't say you a child of God and you still jumping people because you didn't like the way they said something. Did it kill you? No. Did it mess with your salvation? No. My actions messed with my salvation, but their words didn't. So I had to get real with myself and say, you know what? You got a bad disposition, girl. And this was before I was a, a, a preacher. But I was a child of God. And see, here's the thing that we need to understand. It doesn't matter what your title is. If you call yourself a child of God, then you ought to reflect Jesus at all times. And I had to learn that. Because I had someone that told, I has a person tell me. You do know that people see you and there are those that watch you. I'm like, what? What are they watching me for? And it was like, 
the cause. You seen you gave your life to Christ at a young age and you're not backing down. Because, see, as I was telling y'all about those shameful things I did, I did them for two years. I gave my life to Christ at 20. And I've been there ever since. But here's the thing is that I had to grow and learn because those shameful things that I did in the two years, I didn't realize that when I came in, I brought a lot of that mess with me. So you better look at yourself and see, did you get rid of some of that junk from the street or did you bring it over into your righteous living? You know, see, sometimes people that carry gossip, they were the one in the street that always told everybody's story. They done got saved and ain't learned how to stop telling everybody's story. You know the one that you said. That one right there don't tell her nothing if you don't want it known. There are those that are in the church right now. Why? Because they brought that junk from the street with them and they ain't learned to get rid of it. There are those that have come over into the church and they still don't know how to be real. They would joke us out in the street. And so they still think everything's a joke. And they don't realize how serious it is right now. That we've gotten into those serious stages. And you've heard it many times before. He is soon to come. Honey, let me tell you something. And this is for real. He is soon to come. If you don't believe me, look at Revelation and start reading. You can find nearly everything in Revelation that he said is signs that he is soon to come. You can spot them in Revelation. So I'm here to tell you, we better get real about checking ourselves. I try to check myself all the time. If I feel like I did something wrong, I'll apologize. And I used to, I was not good at apologizing. It was like, well, you'll get over it. That'd be all right. I've learned to say, hey, I'm sorry. I was out of line. I shouldn't have said that. And I don't know why the church has such a hard time saying I'm sorry. I was wrong. We better learn. We better learn and learn fast. Because those things are held to you. The wages of sin is death. Do you want to work your way to hell? Let me tell you something. I don't want to work hard on this side to go to hell. Because all I did was working for the devil. I ain't trying to do that. If it don't align with God, get out. If you don't align with the Lord and what he said, bye-bye. If you are causing me a problem in my salvation and my road to salvation and my journey to my RSVP seat, bye-bye. We better start learning how to give the goodbye. Just because it feels good don't mean it's good for you. Say bye-bye. Just because they know how to talk the sweet talk. Just because she know how to flip that hair just right. I don't care. If it ain't good for your salvation, if it's leading you down a road of damnation, say bye-bye. If it's asking you to do something that you know is out of the will of God, say bye-bye. And if they can't handle a no, say bye-bye. We better start learning how to get rid of those things that's hindering you because those are the things that help you work your way to hell. And I ain't working to go to hell. We better start learning how to do those things that makes it so somebody, God, wants to give you a gift. So that at the end, your end is everlasting life. Who wants your end to be death. But it says, if you have the fruits of those things whereof ye are now ashamed, and those are the things that you are doing right today, and you know that they make you ashamed. If you can't do it in the daylight, in public, in front of people, then don't do it in the dark. Now, mind you, there are certain things that none of us should do in the daytime. You know what I mean. But if you are not able to say it in front of the world, don't say it in the dark. If you can't do it in front of people and it's not going to be something that the church is going to sit in judgment, the law is going to sit in judgment, then don't do it. It's simple. 
if you can't do it before the Lord, don't do it. Because let me tell you something. He is the light of the world, but he can see in the dark. So don't think that just because you did it in the dark, it couldn't be seen. He the light switch. And he knows how to turn it on to see everything you do. There's nothing that you've done that he is not aware of. There is no secret that you think you've hidden that he doesn't know of. And the thing is, like I told them one morning, uh, here's the problem. Everything that you're doing, he can see it, and he's the one sitting on the judgment seat on the day of judgment. So how you gonna, who you going to lie to? Who you going to tell a story to? How you going to make up anything to get back? If you thought you knew how to learn uh, spin a good yarn on this side, let me tell you something. You cannot lie well to God because he already knows. So we better start learning to get it together and get it right. As I said, what's your end going to be? Choose it. You make the choice. Jesus only presents, but he doesn't make the choice for you. The only thing he did is he died for you. So that you had the choice. Because the devil took your choices away. Death was your choice, was your, your end. But Jesus said, I'll come. And I will join them back to you. So that they have a choice. The question is, what choice will you make? Will your end be death? Or will your end be everlasting life? It's only two choices to make. How hard? And let me tell you something. If you say you trust in the Lord, then you shouldn't be doing the same old things you was doing two years ago. If you said that you done gave your life to Christ, you believing in him, you got faith, there should be some changes. I shouldn't see you. Okay, so the devil loves to try and, cl and shut me down when I'm talking. Praise be the Lord. Uh, We're going to close it on out. But yes, if you've done, if you've given your life to Christ, if you've said that you've made changes, look over your life. If you're acting the same way you did two years ago, then know that you got something that you need to fix and you need to work on that because it means that you haven't given over to God. And understand that for you to get the gift of life, for you to use your superpower, you need to enforce your faith. Start enforcing your faith. Start believing that whatever you call on the Lord to do, it shall be done. And then stop acting like he won't. Don't ask him if you don't believe him. Stop wallowing in disbelief. Help thou my unbelief. Ask God to move on your life for your better, for your favor, and then trust him. Don't sit back and decide he ain't. It's okay to be heavy hearted because he was even unto sorrow, sorrowful, even unto death. But he got up and enforced his faith. So you have to do the same. Understand that God will take care of you. He knows his plans for you. He cares for you. So that you might have a successful end. Not that you should die. So I want you to learn to choose what your end going to be. You want life or you want death. It's your choice. Have a blessed week. I will be back on Wednesday night to do... Um, the uh, church that I am pastoring right now. And everyone, please keep me in prayer for that. Um, I just want to do a very good job for the Lord and to bring his people a message from heaven. So keep me in prayer uh, about that and that his will will be done as far as that goes. But I will be on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock uh, doing the Holly Grove Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ um, Bible study. And I have um, combined it with my Thursday night real talk. So um, because I, I teach real, I feel like they can go together. Um, so we will be actually on this Wednesday, we're going to be talking about the Church of Smyrna from the um, churches, the seven churches of Asia Minor. And we're going to be discussing the Church Smyrna. 
So join me, 7 o'clock uh, Wednesday night. Have a blessed week, and I'll see you then.